The carnage of the Shibuya incident was just the beginning because Yuta has been summoned to kill Yuji. Maki's own father wants her dead. Megami becomes the new Zenin clan head. Wait, I guess that's not a bad thing, right? Right? Oh, no. His worst day has rich. just started. After a carefully constructed plan to eliminate Satoru freaking Gojo, it was time for Kenjaku to move on to his real masterpiece, The Culling Games. For a thousand years, Kenjaku had waited and planned for this moment. And with his only obstacle out of the way, and Kenjaku being in possession of Suguru Geto's body, all the pieces fell into place to activate his ultimate ultimate goal of merging Tengen with humanity. Why you may ask? All for the sake of Jujutsu, silly! As once Tengen is merged with humanity, Kurt's energy will be optimized to the point of creating a new strongest creature altogether. The golden age of the Heian era will return. However, to accomplish this goal, Kenjaku requires a ton of curse energy within a barrier, so he can perform the ritual that prepares the humans of Japan for the merger. So first, he needed his cattle. Unfortunately, there aren't many sorcerers with high amounts of curse energy. So throughout Kinjaku's 1000 years of life, he had made binding vows with ancient sorcerers and was able to constrain them inside curse objects so one day they could reincarnate into normal humans when his culling game was ready. But again, this still wasn't enough. He also needed to awaken new sorcerers like Mahito did with Jun. So with Geto's Uzumaki, Kenjaku remotely used Mahito's transfiguration to turn his selected humans into sorcerers. Those who were force-fed the curse objects had their bodies strengthened much like Yuji's so they can bear being vessels. Also, other marked humans who had capacity for curse techniques had their brains adjusted so they can use Jujutsu. Now with the ingredients ready, the next stage was to set the battlefield, which was Japan's districts divided into 10 colonies. Within them, the sorcerers will have to fight for survival, as their death releases enough curse energy to be used by Kenjaku. As a result, on November 1st, the culling game finally begins. However, our gang were already dealing with the aftermath of Shibuya. So on the first day of the game, the Jujutsu higher-ups had other things which were more concerning to say the least. Yuji Itadori, with him being Sukuna's vessel and the outburst that led to the Shibuya massacre, the higher-ups reinstated the order to execute Yuji and who other than the next Gojo Yuta Akatsu to carry out this job, right? Yeah! Shut the f*** up. This meant Yuta was placed under a binding vow just to make sure it happens. They also pinned the blame of Shibuya on Gojo as he allowed it to happen, making it a crime to unseal him. On top of that, Geto is deemed to be back from the dead, so his execution is also reinstated. And the most shocking of all, Principal Yaga has also been given the death sentence as he is deemed guilty for supporting Geto and Gojo's deeds. But due to the corruption and them being absolute they also secretly want his technique before they end him because it's so powerful and can create their own army. Essentially, Principal Yaga could manufacture self-sustaining cursed corpses like Panda. He could even make an army that could take over the entire Jujutsu world. So, these guys wanted it for themselves. If the higher-ups were able to gain this knowledge of the technique, then they can rule the world or stop any potential opportunity position against them. So, they send none other than Gaku Ganji after him. The results of this fight was expected, as Gage, the writer of Jujutsu Kaisen, pretty much supports the villains of this show. However, before he dies, Yaga revealed the secret to his technique. Knowing the corrupt nature of the high rups, the knowledge Yaga left him was a curse. Yaga's death completely devastated his son Panda, who arrived at the scene just a little too late but avoided fighting, resorting to crying and took Yaga's corpse away. Things were also going to sh**. 
in the Kamo clan because none other than our main villain Kenjaku had thoroughly destroyed and taken it over. He even threw out Junior Naratoshi Kamo, the rightful next head of the clan, telling him that he had won over a bunch of Jujutsu officials as well. They simply wanted to side with the person who would win this war. We then moved the timeline to November 8th. A week later, Yuji, who was still coming to terms on what Sukuna did using his body, decides to distance himself from Jujutsu High by pairing off with his newfound brother Choso. Although Yuji shows regret for killing Keshizu and Iso, Choso tells him it doesn't matter as they are family. 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 Now to make penance for Shibuya, Yuji decides to wipe out as many cursed spirits as he can, which of course is light work for him, but whilst he is insta-killing all these curses, Choso is stunned at Yuji's progression. He knew Yuji was built different during their fight in Shibuya, but in just a few days, he has added finesse and achieved even more control over curse energy, which caused Choso to declare him a demon god. This evolution is not only due to the fight Yuji had with Mahito, but also through ingesting more of Sukuna's fingers. However, their brotherly time is into Interrupted by this bozo, this misogynist called Naoya Zenin. Who? Okay, now Beto, the current head of the Zenin clan, he died after Jogo's touch, right? So the question of succession has risen amongst the family, and now Beto's youngest son thinks he should be the new head. There is a slight issue though. The old man's will did name Naoya as the 27th head, but there was a stipulation that if something happened to Gojo, then Megami would be named the head himself. This is because he has inherited the clan's signature technique, the Ten Shadows, which is seen as the pinnacle of Zenin power, to the point of killing six eyes and limitless user from the Gojo clan in the past. However, Naoya, who sees himself as him, of course can't let that slide. So, he figures that Megumi will be with Sukuna's vessel Yuji and he vows to kill them both, which has led him to face off against Yuji and Choso. But as they fight starts, another challenger approaches, Yuta Akatsu, who has been given a binding vow to execute Yuji Itadori. Yuta being the current strongest of the Gojo's ceiling makes light work of Yuji and actually gives him his second death. He kills him, bruh. Then he brings his dead body in front of Choso, who's nearly done putting Naoya in a coffin. Sadly for Choso though, Yuta sends him to sleep without even a bedtime story and proceeds to heal Naoya with his reverse curse technique, all so he can tell his superiors about Yuji's death. But, well, 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 Yuji is not dead. All this time, Yuta was playing the higher ups. He did so by making a binding vow, which was fulfilled when his heart stopped. And with Naoya seeing the dead boy, everyone will believe that Sukuna's vessel is gone. However, Yuji is built different, as my guy can come back from the dead. Hence why Yuta bet on his plan, relying on his reverse curse technique to promptly heal his heart once it stopped. Because, come on man, there ain't no way he was gonna kill Gojo's precious student, especially considering that these higher up bozos want to execute Yuta himself for similar reasons to Yuji. We all remember these bloody hypocrites wanted to kill Yuta too, and then Gojo had to yap his way out of that. So Yuta don't get killed, and now Yuta's gonna kill the guy in the same position? Come on, Yuta ain't a hypocrite out here, ladies and gentlemen. Now, it's important to mention that there was a huge side effect upon Yuji's second death. A memory of his family was unlocked. He witnesses his grandpa talking to his father. He thinks Jin will die if he keeps giving Yuji's mother back shots. Uh, pause. You heard that right. You see those stitches? That's Kenjaku that has taken over Yuji's mother, who risked it all just for his culling game to work. Not too long ago, Choso was prompting Yuji to recollect his memories on whether his father had stitches on his forehead, as he believed that before Kenjaku jumped into Geto's body, he had taken over Yuji's dad, but instead, it was his dead mother Kaori. Yuji's father, either in grief, denial or desperation, accepted Kenjaku's violation of stealing his wife's body. 
just so he can have a child. As Yuji wakes up from reliving his baby years, Yuta explains what happened and Megami shows up to bring him back into the fold with the other students. However, Yuji doesn't want to go back and have more people depend on him only for them to die. So Megami tells him to shut his ass up as he is being selfish by giving up all alone, which makes Yuji realize a greater purpose of being needed by his friends. They aren't heroes who must seek justice. They are Jujutsu sorcerers. They don't have the luxury of dwelling on themselves. They just have to keep saving people. And Itadori should start by saving Megami's sister Sumiki, who has become a player in the culling games. Moving us on swiftly to November 9th, where the first order of business was to reunite with their friends, or should I say, what was left of them. Their biggest disadvantage at this point was their lack of information on Kenjaku and the culling gang. So the gang, they decide to talk with Master Tengen because thanks to Tengen's ability, she knows nearly everything that goes on inside her barriers across Japan. Moreover, she was an ancient being who preached the foundation of Jujutsu back in the Nara period, making it clear that Tengen would unravel the mysteries of Kenjaku and his intentions, especially since it's revealed later on that Kenjaku considers this woman a friend. Now it turns out that she has gotten worse. There is an imbalance created due to the existence of cursed energy and people like Yuki wanted a permanent answer to this imbalance. Curses, sorcerers and non-sorcerers create the Jujutsu society but they are not equal and this inequality has been at the center of conflict. Yuki's aim was to remove cursed energy as a whole which would put all humans on the same playground. This would also remove the cursed spirits from the picture as they are created from humans leaking cursed energy. Kenjaku on the other hand completely disagrees with Yuki. He doesn't care about morals and cares only about one thing. We need to optimize that cursed energy fam. <laughs> to him, curses, sorcerers and non-sorcerers are just different possibilities of cursed energy in the form of human beings who he believes have more potential than they are currently offering. Curses and sorcerers being pit against each other would have eventually pushed one another to reach a higher state. However, Kenjaku came to realize that this advancement is a limited way to evolve cursed energy and he believes the answer lies in the amalgamation of curses and humans. After the failure of the death painting, Kenjaku stated he cannot be the creator of this evolution as anything he creates will be limited by his own potential. So to advance the world, chaos is needed and rather than depending on humans reaching to the next stage on their own, he has plans to forcefully transcend the people of Japan by emerging them all together. Now, to make this happen, Tengen had to be in the state she is in, who currently looks like a big fat toe. Well, to be fair, that's not really her. Let me get them digits, girl. <laughs> in reality, she is pretty much everywhere, but being a master of barriers, she is able to keep herself intact. Master Tengen, not merging with the star plasma vessel, caused her to transcend to the point where she doesn't have a physical form, which is exactly what Kenjaku needed. For many years, he had been trying to interrupt Tengen's merger, but had always failed because of Six Eyes users. As the Six Eyes users and the Star Plasma Vessel and Tengen are all interlocked by the heavens and fate. However, in 2006, Toji broke the chain of fate and caused the evolution of Tengen, making her now more akin to a cursed spirit. Hence, she's now vulnerable to Geto's technique, which is of course in the hands of Kenjaku. And for those that are still scratching your head, I still don't get it. Bra is spelled out. Geto has cursed spirit manipulation technique, right? She's a cursed spirit. Kenjaku can control her now. That's why he summons her like a Pokemon later on in the video, which we will explain. Damn, that's crazy. Now, 
Usually, Tengen would only merge with a Star Plasma compatible vessel, but Kenjaku can now force Tengen to merge with everyone in Japan, making more than 100 million people into something like a cursed spirit. Everyone will combine as Tengen holds them in place, and then go through a distillation process similar to the Uzumaki technique. Kenjaku's goal is witnessing what the conglomeration of cursed energy would look like. To him, it's all for the lols, man. I, I, I want to have a fun and a good night and laugh. Sussy bata. And possibly, might be able to extract it using Uzumaki. Now, when the merger finally begins, the world we know will cease to exist as we enter a new one, which won't be any better. In fact, it will be the worst case scenario for everyone. However, for this scenario to be attained, Kenjaku started the culling game ritual, where barriers placed around 10 colonies will accumulate curse energy from the deaths of thousands of sorcerers and even various curses who he made binding vows with. Each colony is connected to the other by the barriers and the collected energy flows from the western point to the eastern, where other than Hokkaido, the colonies at various places form a line through the entirety of Japan. Once the game ends, there will be enough energy to transcend the humans in Japan to the other side so the merger can happen. Now what is the other side you're probably asking? Well, it's kinda like Nirvana, the state of being without a sense of self. Humans will transcend past their humanity and lose their sense of individuality, merging them all into one. This means even one negative thought will overcome everyone. Like, that's impossible for a Goja fan. You just have to mention Goja once. Hey, Goja died by an owl Bum! The whole world's finished because you just thought of something negative like that. Do you get what I'm trying to say? That's the state of the new world, fam. But in order to create such a ridiculous ritual and scenario for us all, Kenjaku had to place many binding vows with eight rules added to the culling game. These must be abided to even by Kenjaku, the creator of it, who is automatically a player, along with everyone he awakened at the end of Shibuya. Kenjaku not being the game master means that even if he is killed, the games will continue. So here are the rules. Number one, after awakening their curse technique, the players have to declare their participation in the game at a colony of their choice within 19 days. And if you wonder what happens if you don't declare it, then rule number two tells us that they will be subject to curse technique removal, basically death. Number three says that non-players who enter the colony become players at the moment of entry. And that is how you declare your participation. This is how Yuta, Megami and the rest can join. But sadly, if you are a normal human who accidentally enters the colony, then yeah, you're part of the game and you're gonna die. However, if they happen to be already inside the barriers, they do have one chance to leave. So it's not that bad, right? Also, players are allowed to move in and out with no problems but they are still part of the game. That brings me to rule number 4. Players score points by killing each other. Number 5. Points are determined by the game master and indicate a player's value. In short, sorcerers are worth 5 points, non-sorcerers are worth 1. And this game master is pretty much like a program with a user interface in the form of a shikigami called Kogane. Each player will be assigned one to communicate with the game. Rule number 6. Not counting their own life. Players can spend 100 points to negotiate with the game master to add one new rule to the game. Rule number 7, the game master must accept any new proposed rules unless it has a long lasting effect on the game or messes with its objectives. And rule number 8, if a player's score remains the same for 19 days, then that player shall be subject to curse technique removal and die. This means any new sorcerer who are afraid to take a life or kill curse is in a colony or bye bye you, you're not given a choice you're gone this rule in particular is what poses the biggest problem for our gang because Megami feels like his sister will literally die in 10 days as remember it had already been nine days since the game started now I know you're still pretty much confused because the culling game arc is pretty intense and hard to understand Harrison please can you explain the next part
So, with Tengen's explanation out of the way, we come to the primary objective for our gang. One, enter the game and earn hundreds of points to add a new rule that could potentially save Sumiki and the lives of players who do not want to participate. Two, protect Tengen from Kenjaku. And three, unseal Saturo freaking Gojo. Luckily, to unseal Gojo, Tengen has the steps in hand, as he is in possession of the back door to the prison realm. However, only Kenjaku has the authority to open it with the actual prison realm itself, so they have to break it open. Hence why, to save Gojo, they need help from a player in the culling games named Hana Kurusu, who has the ancient sorcerer Angel reincarnated in her. She has the ability to nullify curse techniques similar to the inverted Spear of Heaven or Black Rope, so once they find her, they can make a deal for Gojo to be freed. With that team split up so that they can complete their objective, Yuki and Choso stay behind as Tengen's bodyguards. Maki will head to the Zenin clan to gather some cursed tools, Yuta will join the culling game to get a head start in gathering points along with some intel, whilst Yuji and Megumi head over to recruit Hakari Kinji. Despite being one of the strongest students in Jujutsu High, he was a suspended third year who was running a fight club for hand-to-hand -hand combat between sorcerers for money. In fact, Yuta even admitted that when on a roll, Hakari was stronger than him, so getting his help will make a big difference. The next day, they infiltrate his club with Yuji posing as a fighter, where coincidentally, Panda was thinking along the same lines, and this is where they reunite. After impressing Hakari by showcasing his power, Yuji is invited to meet with him. Meanwhile, Panda and Megumi tried to clear obstacles on their way to Hakari, like Kirara and his companion. Kirara believed that Megumi and Panda were with Jujutsu High, and you know, starting a fight club is kinda illegal, frowned upon at the very least. Which is why Megumi explains that they need Hakari's cooperation, which completely catches Kirara off guard because why the hell would they need a suspended student when they have Gojo? Well, Megumi spills the beans about Gojo's ceiling, but Kirara doesn't buy it a single bit, forcing Megumi to fight. Eventually, he succeeded in grabbing hold of Kirara and begged on his knees for their help. That's when we see Hikari and Yuji in a bloody fight. Just as he got offered a job by Hikari, he acted too dumb. Play dumb. Who's Morales? Not that dumb. And Hikari figured out that he had some other intentions, immediately jumping into a brawl. However, Yuji didn't throw a single punch, which shocked Hikari, as even Gojo had praised Hikari's destructiveness. So he agrees to hear Yuji out as long as he can keep tanking the attacks. Hikari is testing Yuji here, because when a sorcerer asks another for help, it is understood that it's a plea to put one's life on the line. However, Yuji says that he wants to recruit Hikari because others told him that he was strong. He is simply a cog, a cog whose job is to kill cursed spirits. And if Hikari can help him achieve that, then he won't budge even an inch until he has convinced him to help. This mentality completely stuns Hikari as Bro just tanked three unguarded punches from a special grade sorcerer without even flinching. This proved Yuji's resolve and caused Hikari to cut a deal with the students. The deal was that if Hikari helps them during the culling games, then Megami, using his new influence as the head of the Zenin clan, must amend for the jujutsu rules in Hikari's liking. However, this conversation is cut short with an appearance from a Kogane. However, they're only supposed to appear after you've declared your participation, which none of the characters have done in the group. So how did it appear? Well, it turns out that Sukuna had made a vow with Kinjaku to become a participant of the Culling Games, making Yuji a player already. The Kogane declares a new rule that every player has access to all information about other players. This rule was added by an extremely formidable reincarnated sorcerer, Kashimo Hajime, who has eyes only for Sukuna. Because in the past, he was the Gojo of his era and was shown to have defeated everyone, leaving himself dissatisfied. Hence, he had cut a deal with Kinjaku to be reborn and take part in the Culling Games for a chance to fight the strongest. However, Kogane's announcement gave Megami a new idea, that they should hunt for players who already have more than 100 points so that they could force them into adding new rules. This method would be faster than just getting the points for themselves. And so their targets narrowed down to two players and decided to split into duos. Panda and Hikari went to hunt down Kashimo in Tokyo Number 2 Colony, whilst Megami and Yuji would seek Higaruma, an awakened sorcerer in Tokyo number one. We then move to the bloodiest day of this entire arc. After Maki's separation from the gang, she wanted to grab some OP tools from the Zenin clan, but anticipating Maki's return, her father had prepared an 
excellent surprise for her. Since anyone attempting to free Gojo was branded as a traitor, Maki's father could finally get rid of the stains that were his daughters. So Oggy took my hostage in the empty curse tool storage area and fought Maki, completely obliterating her only to leave the two to fight multiple grade two or lower spirits. Mai was already too weak to fight and Maki didn't have a weapon with her anymore. So this was basically a death sentence. Until Mai did the unthinkable. In the Jujutsu world, identical twins share cursed energy like one person. So for Maki to unlock her full potential, Mai had to die, which is exactly what she does by using all her cursed energy to craft her sister the split soul katana, giving Maki her full awakening. With the curse to destroy everything given to her by her sister, Maki embodied Toji and decimated her father. But she didn't stop there. Maki's vengeance was against the entire Zinin clan for ostracizing her and Mai for all those years. So in one day, the entire clan was massacred. Which is an insane feat because the Zenin had multiple grade 1 sorcerers like Nyoya, but they were all light work for the awakened Maki who had gained the strength on the level of Toji. Yuji and Megumi then drop into Tokyo Colony number 1. However, since it's a battle royale, they are separated as they enter the barrier. Yuji instantly fights off two bully players who target newbies for easy points. He of course quickly dispatches the fodder and coincidentally meets an old schoolmate named Amai who tells him Hikaruma's whereabouts. On the other hand, Megumi's fate was not as great because of this girl Remy who wanted him to become her knight in exchange for Higuruma's location. Which was a complete lie as Remy instead took him to a reincarnated sorcerer called Reggie whilst Yuji had to face off against Higuruma all alone. Higuruma used to be a defense attorney who often took on impossibly difficult cases in order to protect the wrongfully accused. But when the court rulings didn't favor his clients, they would often hold him guilty. When he tried to not let this bother him, the justice system unfairly found his most recent client guilty despite the overwhelming evidence in their favor. This led to Higuruma snapping and with his curse technique awakening at that moment, he demanded a retrial in his rage. But his mindset had completely changed as he ended up murdering the prosecutor and the judge using his technique. In this way, Higuruma and Yuji are quite similar, where Yuji currently sees himself as a cog in the machine who has to kill curses. Higuruma also was a cog for justice. However, he snapped when confronted with the fact that justice was corrupted. So this matchup is perfect, where Yuji, who feels guilt for Sakuna's actions in Shibuya, now has to go to court where these crimes are brought up. But before then, Yuji tries to negotiate with Higuruma as he's a modern day sorcerer who might empathize more with them trying to end the game. However, Higuruma declines this offer because he wanted to test whether or not the rules of the Culling Games punish the offenders, unlike the criminal justice system. The fight begins with Higuruma instantly trapping Yuji inside his domain, deadly sentencing. As the domain of the court was manifesting around them, Yuji quickly rushed towards Higuruma and kicked him, but to his shock, his legs stopped before they could hit the lawyer. It turns out that this domain doesn't allow any violence to take place. Instead, the accused must defend themselves by providing evidence against their case. If the evidence doesn't suffice, then the judgment will decree a verdict to the one trapped inside of the domain. In Yuji's case, Bro lost the trial about him playing Pachinko as a minor in an instant, which caused his cursed energy to be taken away. Although a newly awakened sorcerer, Higuruma was completely busted, and in this weakened state, Yuji was having a difficult time fighting him. So using the few brain cells that he's got, he asked for a retrial. However, this time Yuji was accused of mass murder in Shibuya. He instantly pled guilty, causing judgment to decree a verdict of the death penalty. This verdict gave Higuruma the executioner's sword, which can kill the guilty with a single hit. But this puzzled Higuruma as he had the evidence in hand about the massacre in Shibuya being the fault of Sukuna and not Yuji. Yuji's decision to take the blame head on for actions he didn't even commit consciously, but rather his body committed due to Sukuna's control, completely changed Higuruma's mind. He was shown that there were still bright spots in this world. Yuji's resolve to stop the Cullen Games came from a pure place. And so the lawyer dispels his curse technique and uses his 100 points to add rule number 10, which allowed players to transfer points. So the non-combative sorcerers can survive without earning points for themselves. Meanwhile, Megumi is left fighting against Reggie, which turns into a 3v1 when Reggie's henchmen show up to join the battle. As Megumi makes quick work of one of them, Reggie and his friend Yori are still formidable. However, another modern day sorcerer, Takaba, shows up. He takes on Yori and defeats him in a flash because this man is 
beyond broken as he can turn anything he finds funny into reality. Like giving his opponents the 1000 years of pain to obliterate him. Megumi on the other hand is having quite a tough time against Reggie but the tables turn when Reggie gets lured into a gym to become a perfect enclosed space for Megumi to activate his Chimera Shadow Garden domain expansion. With it still being an incomplete domain, Megumi didn't get the guaranteed hit effect, but it boosted his 10 shadows overall potential to 120%. But this was to our boy's favor as Reggie didn't realize that Megumi's attacks didn't have a 100% hit rate, so he was forced to use a technique to negate that can't miss effect of domains without actually needing to. Whilst Reggie thought it was all chill, Megumi's toes were still able to blind him as they aren't techniques but physical manifestations. With Chimera Shadow Garden literally turning the whole area into a shadowy pit, it allows Megumi's Shikigami to swim in and out of the shadows to throw off their opponents, but this can also be used against him as we see Reggie summoning three cars and dropping them into the shadows. Basically, Megumi can store objects in his shadow, but the object's weight must correlate to how much weight he can withstand. So with having three cars dropped into his shadow, Megumi is immobilized. However, he wasn't done yet as he summoned Max Elephant on top of Reggie, turning the battle into a contest of bearing weight. As the final move, Reggie summons a whole house on top of Megumi, only for him to dispel the domain and drop both through the floor of the gym into a basement pool, rendering all of Reggie's summoning receipts useless, which inevitably caused Reggie's defeat, taking Megumi's point total to 51. However, upon his death, Reggie gives Megumi a curse that fate will toy with him before he dies like a fool, which hints at Sukuna taking over Megumi at the end of the Kling Games arc. This fight took everything Megumi had in the tank to win, and soon after he collapsed onto the ground. But luckily, he is saved by Hana Kurusu, one of the key people that they were looking for. On the other side of the map in the Sendai colony, Yuta was fighting and dispatching high-level opponents as though they were nothing. Like the reincarnated Druv, an incarnated sorcerer who once conquered all of Japan. Yet, he was light work for Yuta. As we witness his crazy utilization of positive energy by shooting it out of his mouth whilst kissing a special grade cockroach. However, the toughest opponents for him were the reincarnated Uru and Ryu, against whom Yuta was forced to use the full extent of his abilities. Uru being a 1000 year old sorcerer that once was the captain of the Sun and Moon Star Squad, had deep resentment to the Fujiwara clan due to one of their members betraying her. In her interaction with Yuta, she comes to realize that he's related to this clan, which encourages her to kill him. Whereas Ryu wants Yuta all for himself, because in his era, he was never satisfied and believes that Yuta can do the job. Yuta had to use RCT to survive their attacks and using Rika, he completely took over the battle forcing a three-way domain clash. Which actually doesn't last because it gets interrupted by the special grade cockroach that Yuta had previously smashed and dashed. After which Yuta outsmarts Uro who gets hit by Ryu's granite blast rendering her useless but not before her arm gets chopped off by the bug to be consequently consumed by Rika, allowing Yuta to use her sky manipulation technique with his copy ability. This gives him a huge advantage advantage against Ryu, who has the highest cursed energy output in the entire culling games. Finally, Yuta uses Uro's thin ice breaker to turn Ryu's granite blast against him, getting the dub. As the fight ends, Ryu and Uro both acknowledge Yuta's strength, giving him all their points, totaling his score to 200. But Yuta is also left with a fundamental message from these ancient sorcerers regarding his softness. To be like Sukuna and the other greats, Yuta must let go of his feelings and have overwhelming aggression that disregards all else and become a natural calamity. In regards to those suppressing human thinking, we come to Hakari Kenji, who finally reveals his ideal death gamble domain against a manga artist. Honestly, this has to be the easiest battle that happened for Yuji's allies up until this point. On November 12, Hakari comes across a newly awakened sorcerer, Charles, who wants a reason to fight in the culling games in order to create a better battle manga. So after pleading to be shattered, that on Hakari delivers and straight up disrespects him saying he is trash and won't read his manga. To further end this man's career, Hakari beats the shit out of him without even taking his hands out of his pocket. And the rest of the work was easily done by his domain as he was on a lucky roll getting a cursed energy bonus. Hakari's domain is one of the most busted things in existence as it's pachinko based. Here a game of chance is played. His goal is to line up three same numbers to hit a jackpot which allows him to enter unkillable mode. This mode grants Hakari a bonus of unlimited cursed energy for 4 minutes and 11 
seconds, the exact duration of the Private Pure Love Train theme song, which also plays throughout the round. So yeah, he has his own OST while he's fighting. This limitless cursed energy then causes Akari's body to reflexively use RCT to automatically heal any injury, making him basically immortal. Although he only has a 1 out of 239 chance to hit this jackpot, it's suspicious how he kept hitting jackpot after jackpot in his recent fight. So I think external factors play a role too. For example, when he starts his fight with Charles, it's November 12, 12, 11 p.m. After their little chat, he opens his domain at 12, 12 p.m. A lucky coincidence, am I right guys? But the worst of the fights had to fall into the lap of poor Panda. Someone called PETA because Kashimo using his electricity fried him so badly that not only did both of his siblings in his core die, but he also turned into a chibi version of himself. Before Kashimo could end Panda for good, Hakari interrupted. While already being beefed up from the bonus he received in his fight against Charles, he got hit with another cursed energy bonus, shocking Kashimo because Hakari was immortal. However, a master move from Kashimo to use his electricity in water almost ended up killing Hakari had it not been for his spontaneous binding vow to sacrifice his left arm. Kashimo states he had lost this fight due to not being able to use his one-time, one-use curse technique, which he had saved only for Sukuna. In the end, Hakari chose not to kill Kashimo. Instead, he just took his 100 points and asked him to join their side in exchange for a chance to fight Sukuna. This then brings us to November 14th, where there was another beast in the making and it was none other than Maki Zenin. She had partnered up with a change to Naruto Shikamo in the Sakurajima colony when they felt a sinister presence. Maki's worst nightmare was here in the form of a vengeful special grade curse spirit, Naoya. Because it wasn't Maki who finished him off, but her mother, who didn't use curse energy, so he came back with one goal in mind. Destroy Maki. He instantly breaks the sound barrier and smashes Maki onto the ground. Even with the help of Noritoshi, the womb was quite troublesome. And just as we thought he was dead, it transforms into an even deadlier curse. In this state, it completely overwhelms Maki, hitting her at Mach 3 speeds. But before Maki is finished for good, Kamo realizes the importance of Maki's power and asks her to escape while he distracts Naoya. All hope is not lost though, because these two clowns decide to interrupt the fight. And if you're wondering where they came from, then... He's behind me, isn't he? Okay, we don't talk about that. I don't want to die. The old man is Hagane Daido, a reincarnated player from Demon Slayer as he loves swords and even showcases the first form of water breathing. He's an outlier in the game because he has no cursed energy whatsoever similar to Maki. So with the fight against Naoya not going the way of our sorcerers, Maki gives this old man her katana as a way to break this stalemate. However, when he wields the sword, everyone in the battlefield is stunned by the sensation of pure lethality. In return, Daido tells Maki that he can sense Naoya without cursed energy because he can see everything else around Naoya. Huh? Yeah, Maki is just as confused as all of us. But this is important, as Naoya's speed makes him barely visible when he attacks. If Maki can understand what Daido meant by this, she can unlock a way to defeat him. So logically, of course, to find out what she's missing from truly becoming like Toji, she enters the other reincarnated sorcerer, Mio's domain, who only loves one thing, sumo battles. Conveniently for Maki, inside the domain is the hyperbolic time chamber where 1000 matches inside is one minute on the outside. In the domain, Maki realizes that she has always been going through life alone without a teacher or tutor, but to reach her full potential, she must receive guidance. So she fights Mio for three whole minutes or 3000 matches while pondering on the words of Daido, finally finding her true strength. After which, Naoya's speed is nothing to Maki as she can perceive and keep up with it like it's child's play. Not even Naoya's domain could stop her as Maki is proclaimed to be equal or have surpassed even the demonic Toji Zenin now. On the same day, we find out that Megumi has survived thanks to Hana Kurusu as he found himself in a hotel alongside Takaba and Yuji. Now, if you're wondering why Hana saved Megumi, then the answer is simple. He saved her in the past. Turns out Hana was being being raised by a cursed spirit who thought it was her mother. Any child who objected would disappear so the children complied. Luckily though, Hana spotted one of Megumi's divine dogs and was saved. So now, 
she is just returning the favor. The info about the mother curse flips our perception of curses altogether because why is a cursed spirit showing maternal instincts and instead of eating humans, it's trying to nurture them? This brings into question the nature of curses and where they are headed. It's almost like humans start off innocent and as they go through life, they become more malevolent and curse-like with hatred in their heart, which seeps out of them. But curses start off as mindless freaks who only know one thing, to destroy and hurt humans. However, as they grow stronger or evolve, they start exhibiting human-like traits of intelligence and reason. Just look at Joe Goat, who genuinely cared about his comrades in his final moments and felt rage at their demise. Anyways, let's get back to the negotiation with Angel and Hana about unsealing Gojo. She explains how, although she lived symbiotically with Hana, the reincarnation of ancient sorcerers was against her creed as it killed the original host. Thus, she had the same demand as Kashimo to kill the disgraced one. One, Sukuna. Which is kind of a problem because to kill Sukuna means you gotta kill Yuji, which Yuji would be happy enough to do because bro has some screws loose, but not his friends. Before this conversation could go any further, the Koganis started announcing the entries of a bunch of players into the colonies who weren't sorcerers or curses, rather troops from the US. Which is kind of odd because I don't see a single barrel of oil around, so what are they doing here? Well, the reason isn't far off from oil because Kenjaku went to the US and revealed to the president and his cabinet the existence of cursed energy, which led the Secretary of Energy to conclude that someone like Gojo could power an entire nation, hence ordering the protection of people who can use cursed energy. However, this was all for Kenjaku's selfish motives, as he only wanted to create more and more cursed energy inside the colonies. So the death of even non-sorcerers in large numbers would satisfy this. Our gang, of course, wants to stop the soldiers from dying to thwart Kenjaku's plans of gathering cursed energy. But Angel says that since the colony they are in has already satisfied the requirement, there is no point in saving the soldiers and putting their lives at risk. However, Hana agrees with Megumi and they end up helping the soldiers who are actively trying to kill them. A few days passed and on November 16th, things started to happen at the Star Corridors, the home of Tengen. Remember, Yuki and Choso stayed behind to defend Tengen from Kenjaku, who wants to use him to merge all of Japan with. While waiting for Kenny to arrive, Yuki has a conversation with Tengen about the morality of merging with the Star Plasma vessels. Because it turns out that even without these vessels, Tengen could have just used her barrier to stay sane. So Yuki wonders why she would let all those young girls die with the false pretense of Jujutsu society coming in danger if Tengen can't merge. It especially hits close to home for her as she is a Star Plasma vessel herself, who wasn't chosen to merge, but still has a connection to every other other vessel feeling them inside of Tengen. Choso decides to fight Kenjaku alone so he can draw out his curse technique and reveal more information to Yuki before she joins as there's no way bro can beat him. After getting some parental beatings from his father along with a huge info dump of how Kenjaku just wants to have fun and see what the merger will look like, he reveals that Yuji is the eye of the storm and as long as he and Sukuna are alive, the chain of curses will never end. Through this, we also get the idea on how Itadori was specifically made to be a vessel, possibly for the final creature that comes out of Tengen's merger with humanity. As they go on a heated battle, Choso quickly gets overwhelmed by all the cursed spirits, but using the memory of his brothers and imitating their techniques, he forces Kenjaku to reveal his card by using a gravity ability, which causes Yuki to finally enter the battlefield with her innate technique, the Star Rage and her Shikigami Garuda. Her ability is quite simple. She is able to grant virtual mass to herself and Garuda without the loss in speed. This is so strong that in one hit, Yuki overpowers and exercises a divine special grade which can negate concept. In the battle with Kenjaku though, you can't take any chances, so Yuki and Tengen have a plan. It involves forcing Kenny to open his domain so that Tengen, using her barrier technique, can neutralize it. But there is a miscalculation. Kenjaku's domain doesn't have an outer shell similar to Sukuna, so there is nothing for Tengen to attack. Yuki does use a simple domain to counter, but it's quickly stripped away and she gets hit. In just one attack, Yuki is gravely injured with her arm badly mangled, but Choso gets back up to join the party, which doesn't do much, as Kenjaku creates a mini maximum Uzumaki attack and blasts a hole through Yuki's torso. Before she has time to RCT herself, his gravity forces her body to the ground. Choso tries to help her, but he's taken out of the fight with the back of the prison realm in hand. Then Yuki creates the strongest attack in Jujutsu Kaisen, a 
up to this point by giving herself so much mass that she turns into a black hole where not even light can escape. But this rat escaped. Can't keep getting away with it! Turns out Kenjaku's gravity techniques original form was an anti-gravity system which he swiped from Kaori, Yuji's mother. He used reverse cursed energy to inverse its effects and make it into gravitational control. So using his control over anti-gravity, he was able to counter Yuki's black hole. Finally, nothing could stop Kenny from taking Tengen. And at the end, he says goodbye friend. Yup, turns out Tengen, Kenjaku, and Sukuna were once best buddies. After exiting Jujutsu High, Choso rushes to the gang where we find out that they transferred all the 359 points to Megumi. Using them, he adds rule number 11 that allows a player to leave the game by using 100 points and inviting a new player from outside as a substitute. Everything is looking great as Sumiki enters Tokyo Colony number 1, gets 100 points from Megumi, and tells the Kogane to add rule number 12, which will allow players to move between colonies. Wait, what? What? What happened? to the original plot of the movie. All this time, Megumi thought that his sister was an awakened sorcerer, but she was a reincarnated one from 1,000 years ago named Yoruzu. With the reincarnation gaining all knowledge of the hosts present, she was able to blend in and act like Sumiki. And her goal? Well, it's not hard to guess because everyone in this show has the same goal, to fight and beat Sukuna, or I guess uh, fight and get killed by Sukuna. It's fast! It's fast! These are not fast. These are not fast. As Yurizu flies off, everyone is stunned by this development, especially Megumi, who is in a vulnerable mental state, so Sukuna pounces and says, in chain. This was a binding vow between Sukuna and Yuji, which stipulated that Sukuna could gain control of his body for one minute, but he can't kill or hurt anyone during that time. What Yuji didn't foresee was that he wasn't included in this vow, so when Sukuna emerges, he neutralizes Angel, then cuts one of Yuji's fingers off. Megumi tries to do what he always does, when he's inconvenienced, calling Daddy Maharaga. But Sukuna has already seen this trick in Shibuya, so he quickly subdues him and feeds him the finger, turning Megumi into his new vessel. Instantly, we see how much of a fraud Megumi was, as Sukuna summons Nue, which isn't a tiny bird like Potential Man's, but a colossal beast towering over buildings and zaps everyone from Maki to Takaba onto the ground. However, Angel sprouts back up and conjures an attack that has the potential to kill Sukuna for good. Jacob's ladder, which would purify him from the soul with nothing remaining. However, Sukuna takes advantage of Hana's sympathy towards her savior Megumi and gives her a very fun hug. Right after, Yuji gets back up and charges at Sukuna, who is impressed by his strength. And he even says something peculiar. Kenjaku does the grossest things, which suggests that Kenny created Yuji for a specific reason and the process is unnatural. Yuji is sick of all this and takes this chance to ask Sukuna why he spreads misery. To which the king of curses just says, why are you such a weak little bitch? Continuing on this path only means more destruction for you, yet you wish to be happy for as long as possible? You should spend this time trying to stop your misery which roots from weakness. Bored out of his mind by Yuji, Sukuna legitimately tries a lethal blow on him, but Megumi saves him from within by limiting Sukuna's cursed energy output to only 10%. That's not all though, because Maki has shown up making this a 2v1, I guess 3v1, because Megumi is inside him, and as Maki and Yuji plan to cut Sukuna with her split soul katana that can affect the soul directly, Ura Ume shows up and freezes them while Sukuna flies off to take a bath. This bath consists of cursed spirit juices. Sukuna submerging in it will bring him closer to killing off Megumi's soul with all the evil he will be soaking in. To further destroy Megumi's soul and will, Sukuna then goes to fight Yoruzu in Sendai Colony because if he destroys his sister using his own body and technique, Megumi's soul will will break, giving Sukuna full control. Moving to Sendai, Sukuna is greeted by Ryu, who even gave Yuta a decent fight, but before her broken fire has granite blast, he gets sliced into pieces instantly, allowing the epic fight between Sukuna and Yoruzu to commence. 1000 years ago, Yoruzu was a formidable sorcerer acknowledged by the Fujiwara clan after she defeated their top 5 generals using her construction technique, but one fateful day, her life would be turned upside down when Sukuna was 
invited as an idol for worship. All she wanted was some Chinese pastries at the festival, but at one glance, it was love at first sight. Recognizing Sukuna's enormous strength, Yoruzu jumped at him and hugged him because she thought he was lonely just like her. She wanted to stand beside Sukuna and drive away his loneliness, but as she is saying this, she doesn't even realize that she had already been slashed in half by Sukuna. This was just her projection of loneliness on the King of Curses who wears his solitude as a sign of strength. However, because of the culling game, she has one more chance to impress and marry the King of Curses. And the only way Sukuna will be impressed is of course when someone kills him. So they make a binding vow that if Yoruzu wins, she can marry his corpse. The disrespect to Yoruzu in this fight is incredible. Sukuna doesn't even use his own techniques against her as he wants to kill Megumi's sister using his own 10 shadows. His use of it is showcased with summoning two new Shikigami, the round deer which outputs positive energy and the piercing ox that doesn't give Yoruzu a single second to breathe as it keeps charging at her. However, in a last ditch effort to impress her future husband, Yoruzu surpasses her limits and creates a true sphere made of liquid metal that has no contact area. An infinite smooth sphere creates infinite pressure along the surface. It's so powerful that just by moving, it erases the ground beneath. Yoruzu even entraps Sukuna in her domain for a sure hit. However, this whole time, Sukuna had Maharaga's wheel on his head and since the spear is made of the same liquid metal as all of Yoruzu's other constructions, Maharaga, having already adapted to it, quickly dispels it. As a last act of love, Yoruzu leaves Sukuna with a parting gift, constructing a replica of the Kamutoke or Vajra, a weapon Sukuna used during the Heian era. Yoruzu's defeat also meant Sumiki's death, which completely breaks Megumi's soul, allowing Sukuna to gain full control. We then move on to November 18th. Kenjaku has acquired 300 points total and added two new rules. Rule number 13, which forbids any new players from entering the culling games. Now, if you're wondering, doesn't that conflict with rule number seven as it will have a long lasting effect on the game? So why does the game master allow it? Well, Kenny glitches the system by saying that if this rule isn't set into place, then he will just destroy Tengen's core barriers that are the foundation of the culling game. So the system has no choice but to pick the less intrusive option, which is this rule. Rule number 14 says that the culling game will end when all the players other than Ghetto and Megumi have died. However, things aren't all that bad because if they just beat Sukuna and Kenjaku, this nightmare will all be over, especially with the strongest weapon in their arsenal about to be unsealed. Satoru freaking Gojo. Luckily, Sukuna's hug didn't game end Hana as she is still able to unlock the prison realm using Jacob's ladder. Although her body isn't at a state where she can fight Sukuna, I have a suspicion that Yuta has copied Jacob's ladder from her. On November 19th, the gang then ventures outside where Hana uses Jacob's ladder on the back of the prison realm, making it disappear. Wait, where is Gojo? Good afternoon, freshman Sean. It's grippy there, isn't it? Or maybe it farts. Turns out that just to be extra cautious, Kenny buried the prison realm 8,000 meters under sea below the Japan Trench. However, this doesn't stop Satoru freaking Gojo as he creates a whole ass earthquake instantly teleporting in front of Kenjaku. However, this reunion is interrupted by Sukuna who wants a piece of Gojo, but turns out he has made a binding vow to hold off on fighting Gojo right now. So Sukuna versus Gojo is postponed to December 24th. In this one month time skip, everyone starts training, including Yuji, who had become more like a cursed object now by being soaked in the cursed energy of Sukuna for so long. Using the book Yuki left behind, Yuji also attained a new ability, Soul Swap, which we see when he soul swaps with Kusakabe. Yuji also gained another new power, blood manipulation, by consuming all of the death painting wombs who have the DNA from the Kamo clan. This is where the culling game arc ends, as the Shinjuku showdown starts with Gojo versus Sakuna. And when asked whether he would lose, Gojo says, <laughs> Nah, I'd win. <laughs> 